Greetings to you, my friend, and welcome to our time together. I'm Pastor Timothy Mews, lead pastor here at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Alliance, Ohio. And this is session number seven on the Gospel of John. Session number seven on the Gospel of John. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome to these sessions. Welcome to this time that we spend together. I hope and pray that it is powerful and important and life-giving for you as we enter into this time. I would certainly encourage you, if this is your first time, to go back and hear some of the previous sessions. Uh, we've walked through the book from uh, from the beginning up until now, so definitely want to go back and check out uh, a lot of the previous work and the previous uh, examples and experiences and the such. If you are returning, once again, thank you for following along. Thank you for being part of this. Uh, I would ask you, if, if you really find this valuable, if you find that you are um, getting something out of this, definitely share it. Share it with your friends. Share it on your Facebook page. Share it on your Instagram account. Uh, any way that you're accessing this. Uh, because it's, it's how we grow. It's, it's the way that these platforms work. So if you are benefiting from this, if you feel that you're getting something out of it, I certainly would encourage you to share uh, these experiences, share these sessions so that other people will get a chance. If you have friends on your Facebook page or uh, on your Instagram account that you really think would benefit from it, share it directly. Uh, I'd be happy to give any kind of information or what have you, but share it directly so people get a chance to know what you're listening to and they understand uh, and get a chance to follow along and experience the Savior. So once again, welcome. It's great to have you here. I certainly would encourage you to have a Bible open before you, uh, whether it's a, a digital Bible or a printed Bible, whatever, whatever works best for you. Look, this is your study. This is your time. This is just my offering for you. So whatever works best for you, is what I would encourage you to use. So if it is a, uh, a paper Bible, then by all means, crack open the binding and get into it. If you find more comfortable working with a, uh, with a digital Bible, something on a screen, then that's great. And if you don't know where to go, I recommend BibleGateway.com. Uh, BibleGateway.com is one of the primary pieces I use for my biblical study when I'm working online. I'm not sponsored by the website or anything of that nature. I don't get anything from it, uh, but I do find that it's a really good resource. It's got a lot of different translations and paraphrases and very easy to navigate. So if you're looking for a resource to go online to get your biblical work or, or just do more study, BibleGateway.com is where I would recommend people go. All right, so we are in chapter 3 now. We have been wading through um, this chapter. We just got done uh, last week with this experience with Nicodemus, this Pharisee, this, this, this darkness education, this darkness energy. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of opposition to Jesus, a lot of opposition to the Messiah. It's, it's kind of funny because the people for a thousand years have been yearning for the Messiah to come. And when the Messiah shows up, they're not happy about it because he has come along to change things and challenge structures. And that's really one of the fascinating things about humans is we don't mind change as long as someone else is doing it. But we don't want to have to challenge our structures. We don't want to have to change our realities. So when the Messiah comes along and when the Messiah shows up, the Messiah... He is the one who's challenging the structures. He's the one who's calling for change in the midst of the people of Israel, in the midst of the temple cult. And it's really not necessarily the people of Israel as a whole. They're ready for change. They're ready to be freed from the oppression that has become the temple. But it's the temple leaders. They don't want to change. They don't want to give up their power. So Jesus comes along. And as I've said many times, you know, when something comes along or someone comes along to challenge the structure, the structure first tries to co-op it and then ostracize it and then kill it. So this is the first chance here. This is the system trying to co-opt Jesus. This is Nicodemus, one of the representatives of the Pharisaean class, one of the representatives of the Sanhedrin, coming to Jesus at night in the cover of darkness to try to convince him to be something different, to try to convince him to be part of the um, part of the current structure. If they could get Jesus to be part of the current structure, to teach what they're teaching, this would be monumental because now they know that this Jesus fellow has the backing of God. They know that this Jesus fellow is is a, is a God representer, and they want his 
representation to to be part of their narrative. So they try to co-opt him. They try to convince him to come on board. And that's what we get. Uh, we get Nicodemus and Jesus kind of sparring back and forth. Ultimately, the narrative ends with Nicodemus just kind of disappearing away. So we see very early on that Jesus is superior to the pharisaical class, uh, superior to the to the law bearers, if you will. This is not to say that Jesus is superior to the law. We'll get to that portion later. But, but there's going to be a contest, a conflict between those who hold the power and Jesus who's coming to give the power. And we see early on that those who hold the power, it's not even a war. I think that's kind of the funny thing is Nicodemus is so badly outmaneuvered. It's not like Nicodemus just lost in a really good sparring part, you know, like the, the fight was a TKO in the 12th round. No, Nicodemus was out of the fight very early because the Pharisees for so long had turned away from what God is doing in the world that by the time God shows up, they just have very little clue about what it means to be true God bears. So then Jesus moves away from Nicodemus and starts to talk about uh, earthly things, heavenly things, talking about, you know, the son of man descending and ascending. Jesus foreshadows his crucifixion uh, when he talks about Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness. So must the son of man be lifted up. Looking back, that's a foreshadowing of the cross. Uh, It could also be considered a foreshadowing of lifted up as an enthroned. And maybe that's what was understood early on. But no, Jesus is foreshadowing the cross. He is foreshadowing what is to come. And what is to come is his crucifixion. So he sets up this dichotomy between him and Moses. Moses lifting up the serpent, saving the people of Israel from from the poisonous bites. Jesus being lifted up so that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And here, my friends, is the pivotal shift. Now, we are so... We're so ingrained in this. We're so filled with it. God's grace permeates us so much that we can often miss the power of certain verses. And this is one of the verses, John three sixteen, a very common verse. Just about everybody knows it. Uh, you might remember the uh, back in the olden times or the olden times back in the past when people wore the, the funny wigs and held up John three sixteen in the end zones of football games. Yeah, so John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. All right, so we know that verse. We know that verse. It's ingrained in us. It's part of our, it's part of our reality. It's part of our faith statement, and we love it. But where that verse sits in reference and in, in, in place uh, in the chapter, now remember, Jesus has just bested the Pharisees. So God has just won against those who hold the law. And Jesus moves on to the next step, eternal life of, of eternal life comes not from law, not from work, not from, from money, not from bartering. Eternal life comes from faith in Jesus. For God so loved the world, here we go, that he gave his only son. Jesus is a gift. The son is a gift to the world. The world didn't own it. The world didn't earn it. The world didn't. There wasn't a point where it's like, okay, it's historically time. You know, regardless of what's happening, I was going to wait 2,000 years and send the sun. And now 2,000 years are up. Um, God didn't set a high water mark for the level of sin before the son of man was sent. No, God so loved the world. The gift of Jesus comes out of love. The gift of eternal life comes out of love. It's love that drives God. It's this immense, incredible love that God has for us and for the world and for the universe and for each other that drives God to do what God does. Now, keep in mind the significance of this. Keep in mind that the people of Israel, they didn't they didn't hang out and dwell in God's love. They dwelled in God's law and God was not punishing them because they were doing the law right. That was the deal. They didn't see love and grace and connection in God. They saw lack of punishment by following the law. They saw the law or were fed that the law was nothing more than the boundaries that were imposed by God to keep them to do the right thing. But they didn't ever see God's love. You know, the law was given because the people were terrible. So the law was a response. 
and the people didn't get squashed by God because they followed the law. Again, God responded. But in Jesus, God gives. And so John 3.16 shows up right after Jesus talks about being lifted up and all those who believe in him. So God loved the world so much. God's love for the world was so immense that he gave his only son that all those who believe in him should not perish, would not perish, but have eternal life. So, so eternal life is a gift. It's a gift given out of love. It's not a duty. It's not a requirement. It's, not a, it's a gift. God gives eternal life out of love. And the way to get that eternal life is to believe in Jesus. It's a gift from God to the people. That's the incredible nature of this. That's the incredible nature of this God. This God loves us enough to gift us with eternal life. Eternal life is a gift from God to us. And we get that gift by believing in God, by believing in the power of the gift. This is a monumental shift. Again, because we're post-resurrection people, we don't necessarily see the, the cataclysmic shift that happens in this. But this is God setting a whole new path of how to interact in the world. This is God doing something completely different than the way it was before. I mean, I I know the church always struggles with the seven last words. We have never done it that way before. And that's what God is saying. I've never done it this way before, but this is how I'm choosing to do it. This is what I'm choosing to do. I am choosing the path of this over that. I am choosing to show love versus anger. I am choosing to give love as a gift, a gift of grace, not something else. God's love for the world is what gives us the gift of belief. I hope you can see this. I hope that you can grasp how monumental this is. We're so broken as people that we can't of our own accord acquire salvation. God has to do that for us. And God could have laid out expectations and hoops and things to jump through that would have made it impossible for us to gain salvation. But God chose not to do that to us. God chose not to put forth in front of us all of these terrible things. God chose to give us hope. God chose to give us a gift. And that gift is love, the love that God has for us in Jesus Christ. So when we look at this verse, this one verse, this pivotal verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life, this gift is incredible. And something that we shouldn't turn aside from, something that we shouldn't see as a less than. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and the people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed." But those who do what is true come to the light so that what so that it may be may it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. So just as pivotal, just as pivotal as as, as John 316 is in this idea of love uh, being the gift, you know, that the the gift of of God comes out of love. God's love for us is 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 this gift. How incredible that is. But just as pivotal as that verse is, John 3.17 is just as pivotal. God didn't send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Jesus' job is not condemnation. Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn others. Jesus didn't come into the world to, to, to show judgment. Jesus came into the world to show grace, to show the path of eternal life. Look, God didn't need to send a judge into the world. He had a whole bunch of people running around in his name judging. They were judging all over the place. Judge, 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 up and down, left and right. Judge, judge, judge. 
That wasn't Jesus' job. Jesus' job was to come in and show the path of salvation. Jesus' job was to come in and show the way to eternal life. And that way through eternal life. Now, one of the other things to keep in mind um, when it comes to judgment, condemnation. Uh, there were, there were a, f- a few years back, uh, I was down the beach uh, for my family vacation. And they always have new t-shirts every year. And most of them are pretty raunchy. But one, one, of, the, uh, one of the t-shirts that I, I, I liked and made me laugh was, uh, it said, I don't have to swim faster than the shark. I just have to swim faster than you. And then Red Bull came out a couple years later with their advertisement campaign where two people are in the in the bush and a, and a lion comes out and the one guy pulls out Red Bull and starts drinking it and uh, and the other one says Red Bull's not going to make you run faster than the lion and the the one with the can says no but it's going to make me run faster than you see and the the point of this is there's this notion that 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 eternal life is a competition that I don't have to be the best, but I just don't have to be, I'm not as bad as you. I don't have to be first in line, I just don't want to be last. If there's 100 seats on the bus, as long as I'm, you know, above 99, that's all I care about. Jesus doesn't work that way. That's not how God works. This is not a competition. There aren't so many seats, and I have to be better than you in order to get in. Condemnation is not how this works. Condemnation is a choice, not by God, but by those who choose not to believe in Jesus, by those who choose not to follow. And this is another big concept that I've talked about often in in separate Bible studies. I've talked about in separate ways and separate areas. And that is this. There, There is only two paths. You are either with God or against God. You are either in the light or outside the light. There is no middle ground. You know, the American gospel, the glory theology that has cropped up in the last 70 years, has created this idea that you can be in God and still fully participate in the world, that you can be in the light, but still act in ways of darkness. That's not how it works. There is no American gospel middle ground. You are either striving to walk in the light, even if you're not. That's the thing. Even if you're not walking in the light, if you're striving to walk in the light, if you're striving to be better, God sees that and God is happy for that. God is happy that you're striving to walk in the light and God will honor that and show grace and commitment to that. But if you're not striving to walk in the light, if you're just embracing the darkness, embracing the evil, embracing the sin, and and please, for anybody who may understand the sensitivity of those words, I'm speaking from the gospel, using this idea of light and darkness. I'm not reflecting that those who, you know, this has nothing to do in my understanding with skin color or skin variation. I know that racial overtones have been used by light skin and dark skin, light being in in with God, dark being outside of God. I understand that and I'm sensitive to that. Um, But this is how the gospel lays it out. Um, This is all about light being exposure to Jesus and darkness, shadow being being dwelling in sin. I want to make sure that, that I'm clear about that as I move forward. So, those who believe in him are not condemned. Those who believe in Jesus are not condemned. Those who believe in Jesus are striving to live a better life, even if they're not fully participant, even if they're not fully embracing it. Look, I mean, that, that's you and I, brothers and sisters. Even if we're striving to live a good life, if you think for a minute that you are not sinning, that you're not dwelling in sin, that you're not dealing with your sin, if you're not confronting your sin, then you and I need to have a big conversation about the nature of sin and the nature of human existence. John tells us anyone who uh, says they're free of sin is lying to themselves and the truth does not uh, reside in them. But those who confess their sins will receive eternal life. Uh, that's so we're sinful brothers and sisters we are the difference is between condemned and not condemned is those who are not condemned are striving to live a life of righteousness striving to live a life in the light whereas those who condemn don't care they don't care about a relationship with jesus they don't care or their relationship with jesus is so outside of of what would be um what would be active and fruitful that's the thing you know, you can, if, if you have a dormant faith, 
If your faith is dormant, I believe in Jesus, but I don't do anything about it. Well, then you're not living in the light. You're living in a lie. You're living in a shadow that says all you need to do is intone faith and, and you're good and you're golden. That's not theology that comes from the scriptures and it's not what comes from John. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. If you're embracing the name of the Son of God, if you believe in Jesus, that belief is going to move you to do something in the name of Christ. If you believe in Jesus, you're going to be moved to do something for the sake of the Savior, for the sake of the kingdom. But if that name doesn't move you, then that really needs to, you need, you need to question just how deeply you believe in it. How important is that name to you and that Savior in your life if, in fact, the name of Jesus is not moved, does not move you to do something? And that's where condemnation and and, and lack of condemnation come in. Condemnation, it's not like, you know, God is walking around looking at all of us the same. We're all doing the same thing. And God's saying, you know, I don't like you. I don't like you. I don't like you. Condemnation comes from the fruit of, of the choices that we make. If we choose not to believe, then that choice comes with a consequence. Welcome to, you know, Einstein. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Every choice has a consequence. Cause and effect. We have a God of grace. We have a God of glory. We have a God of love. And if someone has never been introduced to that God of love, there's a whole different scenario than someone who has been introduced and just chooses not to follow along in the path of that God of love. There's a far cry difference, my brothers and sisters, between not knowing about Jesus and knowing about Jesus and not caring. Very different scenarios. Very different scenarios indeed. So, so condemnation comes not because God willy-nilly chooses or doesn't choose. Condemnation comes because God looks in the heart and the mind of people and says, you know what? You didn't believe. You didn't live into your beliefs. My son didn't mean anything to you. And this is the judgment that the light has come to the people and the people who love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. John is making it clear through the words of Jesus Jesus is speaking, you know, kind to, to John, the, to, to Nicodemus. Nicodemus may still be in the corner of this little interaction, but, but more broadly, the judgment came in that Jesus came in the world because the people loved darkness rather than light. They loved evil rather than good. They chose to do bad rather than strive to do good. They chose to ignore the hungry, overfeed them. They chose to beat down the poor rather than lift them up. They chose to turn against the way of God. And here's the deal. Here's the thing we need to keep in mind. These are not people who are ignorant. They are not ignorant of what God expects of them. They knew exactly what God wanted from them. They knew exactly what God expected of them. And they chose. They chose not to to participate. They chose not to do what God had asked them to do. It's a very big difference from those who didn't know. As Paul says, you know, I didn't know sin until I knew the law. And then once I knew the law, then I knew sin. The people knew the expectations. They knew what it meant to live into the light of God, and they chose to live in darkness. They chose to live in evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. Evil loves shadow. Evil loves darkness. Evil loves to move in ways that's unclear and unknown. That's where evil gets its power. That's where evil gets its strength. Evil doesn't flourish in the light of clarity and vulnerability. Evil flourishes in the shadows, in the corners, in the absence of vulnerability and accountability. That's where evil flourishes. And those who participate in evil function in the shadow. They function in the dark. Because the light exposes. The light shows where evil lurks. And what do we call Jesus? We call Jesus the light of the world, right? Jesus is the light that comes into the world to expose the darkness. 
to expose the darkness of sin, to expose the darkness of, of hatred, of division, of war, of brokenness. And when that exposure happens, look, here's the thing. When, when our darkness is exposed, it stinks. It hurts. We look inside of it and we're like, oh my God, I'm so embarrassed. I'm so, that's so painful. But we can't move forward until our dark shadows are exposed. We can't move forward until the shadows and the darkness are driven out. Because that's only when, that's when we truly know what's going on inside of us. That's when we can truly grasp all that is taking place in our inner being. Those who, are, those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. So those who, who, who are striving, again, keep this in mind. Keep this in mind. When we talk about redemption and righteousness and living in God's grace, we're not saying that you got to be perfect because you're never going to be perfect. We sin. We break, we stumble, we fall, we fail. But the point is, those who are striving to be righteous continue to strive to be righteous. They draw close to the light. They see where their shadows are. They see where their brokenness is. They see where they're failing and strive to do it better. They strive to make it better. It's not just, um, you know, this Pollyannic idea that it's going to be perfect all the time. Because it's not. It's understanding that when we do sin, when we do break down, when we do have a problem, then we can go to God. We can ask for forgiveness. We can ask for redemption and we can strive to be better. Strive to be better. All right. So now we're going to get a shift here. Uh, This is verse 22. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside and he spent some time there with them and baptized. John also was baptizing it at Aenon near Simeon, near, near Salim, excuse me, because water was abundant there and the people coming and the people kept coming and were being baptized. John, of course, had not yet been thrown into prison. So, so Jesus goes into the countryside. So he has this little interaction with Nicodemus. We see that he's got a role or a realm. He's, we see that he's got uh, something, you know, some power and, and some uh, standing up against the Pharisees and the teachings of the time. Okay, so then he goes on into the countryside and he baptizes. So he shows baptism is necessary. Remember that, that, that John the Baptist baptizes Jesus But Jesus also goes and does baptisms. He also participates in the act of baptism. So Jesus and John are both baptizing uh, in in the same time frame. They're both baptizing. uh, They're both giving this gift of redemption, this gift of washing and, and clearing. Clearly, as the text shows, John had not been baptized yet or had not been imprisoned yet. Um, and this, as the story goes, John the Baptist is imprisoned by Herod. Uh, that comes from the Gospel of Matthew, where then he is beheaded and, you know, head on a platter, that whole, that whole thing. So, still very early on, um, John is, is still active and baptizing. And Jesus is baptizing. Uh, Jesus is doing the baptismal uh, actions as well. We don't see anything significant about Jesus' baptism, so they're probably very similar to John's, a washing, a ritual cleansing, a ritual participation that we see uh, for the people. All right, so uh, verse 25, now a decision, now a decision, excuse me, now a discussion about purification arose between John's disciples and the Jews. They came to John and said, Rabbi, The one who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you testified, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. John answered, No one can receive anything except what has been given from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said I am not the Messiah, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. For this reason, my joy has been fulfilled. He must increase, I must decrease. So, so it's kind of funny here because, you know, we, we see the Jews again, and we talked before that, that when John speaks of the Jews, he's mostly talking about the ruling class, the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees. So that's who John is talking about when he talks about the Jews. And he says the Jews 
uh, you know, they're having a discussion about purification between John disciples and the Jews. Um, and so who's doing it right? Who's doing it pure? Who's 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 got the better baptism? Who's got the pure baptism? And you know, and <laughs> you may roll your eyes at this, but let me tell you, my brothers and sisters, that argument still rages today. There are many who believe they have the purer baptism, that their baptism is pure, that their baptism is better than others because of how they baptize, where they baptize, when they baptize. But the fact of the matter is baptism is not something we do. Baptism is an action of God. We are just the vehicles of God's grace. So how we baptize, when we baptize, where we baptize, none of that has any significant impact on the spiritual power of the sacrament. Now, these, again, now there, there certainly is ritual and love and grace is put into it. I, I'm not just willy-nilly, though Philip did baptize the Ethiopian eunuch in a puddle on the side of the road in the book of Acts. There is majesty and there's um, liturgy and there's ceremony to the baptism. But at the end of the day, my friends, it's about what God does in baptism, not about what we do. It's not something magical that we do. It's all about God's grace poured forth into us. And so what John the Baptist is talking about here, you know, they, they come to him. They're like, whose baptism is more pure? Whose baptism is better? Yours or that man do, that you testify to? He's baptizing too, you know. He's out there doing what you're doing. Who's better? Now, you can't compete with the Messiah. John the Baptist knows this. John the Baptist knows that there is no competition. John doesn't want a competition. He doesn't want to be better than Jesus. He wants Jesus to come along. He wants the, the, the Messiah to return. He wants Israel to be redeemed. So because of that, because of that, John's not going to be in competition with Jesus. As a matter of fact, John's going to defer to Jesus. John's going to defer to Jesus in that John's going to say, look, He's got to rise because he's the man and his rising means I fall. There's no place at the top for both of us. John doesn't want to be at the top. This is an example here of the difference between the humility of John's leadership and the arrogance of the Pharisees' leadership. The Pharisees wanted to be the top. They could not see anybody rising above them. They could not see that this Jesus fellow had more power or more place. They could not see that this Jesus deserved to be here. If he was there, they needed to be equal to him. Remember what I talked about with that whole co-opting thing. John the Baptist is like, look, I don't need to be at the top. That's Jesus' place. Me? As he rises, I fall. I'm not going to get in the way. But the Pharisees, they don't think that way. They don't see the humility of serving God. They just see the power of serving God. And that's a problem. That's still a problem today. You know, when I look around, when I listen and pay attention, there's a whole lot of chiefs and not a whole lot of Indians. There's a whole lot of, of, of givers of direction, but not a whole lot of doers. Because they don't want that humility. They want to go stand beside Jesus. They want to be looked upon as a little bit better. That's human hubris and pride and arrogance. The Pharisees were dripping with it. John the Baptist is like, look, I don't want anything like that. John the Baptist was being humble. He was humbling himself before Jesus. He rises, I fall. That's a very powerful statement. And one that needs to happen. Because there is no one that stands equal to the Messiah. No one. So John goes on. The one who comes from above is above all. The one who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks about earthly things. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard. No one accepts his, but yet no one accepts his testimony. Whoever has accepted his testimony has certified this, that God is true. He whom God sent speaks the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has placed and has placed all things in his hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever disobeys the Son will see will not see life, but must endure God's wrath. 
All right, so John goes on a little, little bit more um, philosophical here, a little bit more metaphysical here. But clearly, John sees himself as one who comes from the earth. He sees himself as one born of an earthly mother and father. He has an earthly ministry and he has an earthly job. And that's where he stays. He does not see himself as more than just earthly things. But he does see Jesus as a heavenly thing, as a gift from heaven. And he understands that that gift from heaven is far greater and far more powerful than he is. So John is deferring to Jesus. John is deferring to the Savior. John is deferring to his testimony is, is, is far less than Jesus. John is deferring the testimony say, look, whoever accepts his testimony accepts God. Not mine. John is doing the ritual purification, which anybody can do, though most people didn't want to do it because everything was so corrupt. That's like cleaning the bathroom after it hasn't been done for four or five months. Anybody can do it, but nobody wants to do it. So John here, he, he's challenging this and he's saying, look, and, and he's saying to the Pharisees, look, you all are earthly too. You didn't come from heaven. You reside on the earth. So do earthly things, and that is love and care for and watch over and give hope to. But don't try to do heavenly things. Whoever accepted his testimony is certified that God is true. That God sent the Son into the world to speak the word. So listen to the Son. What he has to say comes from God. It's not just some willy-nilly creation, even if you don't like it. You know, that, that's kind of funny thing about about the word of God is the word of God is the word of God whether we like it or not the word of God is the word of God whether we feel good about it or not God doesn't write his word based on our feelings as a matter of fact for the most part God doesn't really care how we feel when it comes to the avenues of faith the avenues of faith are laid forth by God we as the faithful are called to follow them now can we ask questions of course can we struggle with them absolutely but does our feelings change them? No. Moses couldn't even use his feelings to change God. So it's not about what we feel, my friends. And, and faith, faith is about understanding who's who. God sends the Son into the world to speak the word. Whether we like it or not, whether we feel good about it or not, that's in us. But the word is truth. The word of God is truth. And the word that we've been given is truth. So it is indicative on us to embrace that word and follow it. The father loves the son and has placed all things into his hand. So, so, you know, when we get this vision of Jesus, Jesus isn't, Jesus isn't like the prince who goes off to a foreign land and argues on behalf of his father. Jesus doesn't serve that role in the court, the royal court where the son has been given limited parameter to negotiate something with a foreign king. No, the son in Jesus has all things been given into his hands. So the decisions about everything are in Jesus' hands. God has given Jesus the ultimate power, all power. Not just a little bit, but all of it. And it is up to Jesus to use that power accordingly. So that's where things are at. Jesus has all this power. Jesus can make whatever decisions Jesus needs to or wants to make. Jesus doesn't have to go back to God and ask for direction. Jesus has that direction. That's the power that we see here. The Father loves the Son and has placed all things in His hands. Whoever believes in Jesus has eternal life. Whoever disobeys the Son will not see life but must endure God's wrath. Again, there's no middle ground. There's no middle of the road here. You either have or you don't have. You can either believe in the Son and follow along, or you can't. But, but there's no middle ground. You don't get to say, um, you know, this is where it's at, or that's where it's at. You don't get to say, well, I believe, but I, I don't participate. There's no middle ground. It's either eternal life or wrath. And the more that we can grasp that, the sooner we can accept that, the more we can see the importance of, of being part of this life that we have together and the importance of this part of this life that we strive to live into and this relationship we have with God. All right, my friends, I'm going to leave it there for now. I'm going to leave that with you here. 
Uh, if there's anything that, uh, you know, if, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to reach out to me. My contact information will pop up at the end of the session. Uh, you can email me, direct message me, what have you. Anything that can come about, please feel free to reach out to me and I will uh, either respond to you directly or I will give you some um, direction. Uh, I'll, I'll bring it up in the next session or what have you if I can do that. But uh, So, yeah, reach out to me and let you know if, if you have any questions or comments or what have you. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for being part of this. Like I said before, you know, if, if you find value in this, share it, give it so that uh, it can be um, it can be used for uh, others to, to benefit from hearing the word. Uh, and if I can be of assistance in any way, feel free to be part of that as well. God bless you. Have a great day and a wonderful week.